Hi, this is Dr. Churchill returning for Into the Final Frontier, Astronomy 308. <clears throat> and today we are going to talk about Project, Project Gemini. And Project Gemini was the follow on project from Project Mercury, which we discussed in the previous lecture. And the project then that followed it was Project Apollo, the missions to the moon. So Project Gemini actually was not on the books as NASA decided to go to the moon. As we talk about Project Apollo, we'll talk about when is it that we actually set course to the moon. And it turned out that that was three weeks after Alan Shepard's suborbital flight. So here we had not done any human space flight. We put Alan Shepard into space for 15 minutes in a suborbital lob. And President Kennedy comes out and says, we choose to go to the moon. And that changed everything for NASA. It really picked up, the pace picked up, the intensity picked up, and the, the excitement picked up. Now, they thought they were gonna go straight from Project Mercury into Project Apollo, and they realized, you know what? Based upon the way we plan to do the moon mission, we have to teach our astronauts how to fly spacecraft in a lot of different ways. Like, how to rendezvous with another spacecraft, how to dock with another spacecraft, okay? So that's really what Project Gemini was. It was a stopgap project, which basically says, we're gonna teach the astronauts how to actually fly in space. We're gonna teach the engineers and the ground control crew actually how to work with astronauts who are learning to fly in space and communicate with them. And so there was this whole new level of development that transpired and Project Gemini really was essential to getting to the moon because every single thing that they needed to know to get to the moon, they basically learned in Project Gemini until of course they got to the moon and had to practice doing these things around the moon. And then once they practice uh, really twice around the moon, then they landed on the moon. It was quite astonishing. And the pace which Apollo happened is tremendous. But Project Gemini is what made it happen, kind of swept under the rug in the history books. But today we're going to talk about when humans really learned how to fly in space. Okay, so let's talk about Project Gemini. Welcome to my slide deck of Project Gemini. Okay, the second US manned space program. It was announced in January of 1962, which actually was before Project Mercury ended. So even before Mercury ended, they realized they needed to learn all these things. With Project Gemini, they stepped up from one man spacecraft to two men spacecraft. They called it Gemini for that reason after the uh, constellation of the Zodiac um, called Gemini. And it involved 12 flights. Um, including two unmanned flights. But today I'm basically gonna talk about the manned flights. Now, as I mentioned with Project Mercury, there were definite goals. And uh, these are the three main clear cut goals that were set for Project Gemini. Number one is what to subject uh, man and equipment to space flight for up to two weeks in duration. And the, the, the motivation for that was that it was believed that that's about how long astronauts would take uh, to fly to the moon, uh, walk on the moon, do all that stuff, and then fly home and come home. So basically, they estimated a two-week duration to see if humans could experience uh, and work that long in space and survive that. Uh, to rendezvous and dock with orbiting space uh, vehicles and to maneuver the docked combination by using the target vehicle's propulsion system. Wow, that's a big goal. Okay, it, it contains three major goals within it. Okay, number one is to rendezvous with other spacecraft. So um, rendezvousing in space is something that I can't spend some time talking about, but flying in space is nothing like flying an airplane or, uh, you know, in a sense, driving a car from point A to point B, because you have to follow the, the laws of what's called orbital mechanics. And they're not intuitive. You know, you don't speed up your spacecraft to catch up to another spacecraft. You actually slow your spacecraft down to fall into a lower orbit. And when you fall in a lower orbit, you're speeding up because you're like falling downhill. And then you pass 
when you're, you're, you're getting close to the spacecraft, you actually then um, have to speed up and then let it catch you from behind. Okay, it's, it's really weird. You speed up to let it catch you from behind. Think about that for a minute. Okay, so you have to learn how to rendezvous. Okay, and rendezvous also means not uh, just speeding up or slowing down on your orbit, but it may be that you want to change the plane of your orbit. So instead of circling the equator, you could change your orbit so much that you're going at a, at a right angle uh, to the equator or on what's called a polar orbit. Now that takes a lot of energy, but that's an example of what you call changing orbits. Nobody had done that before, ever. So rendezvous, orbit changing, okay. Then docking. So now you're in orbit, you've rendezvoused, so you're on the same exact orbit as another spacecraft moving at 17,500 miles an hour. And you're gonna now connect those two spacecraft, docking, okay. And now they've docked, now they want to take the object that they, the target vehicle, and they want to use its engines then to change orbits or to, uh, yeah, basically change their orbit. So that's three goals in one. First, they have to learn how to rendezvous. Then once they learn how to rendezvous, they have to learn how to dock without, you know, destroying the spacecraft. And then at the other thing, then they have to learn how to fire that engine and see how the system together, which is a completely new uh, configuration of inertia and mass and how that system is going to work. So that, that was really goal two was really three goals in one. And then goal three was to perfect methods for entering the atmosphere, which they'd done through Project Mercury, but they wanted to uh, practice that better, especially since the Apollo spacecraft would be falling back into Earth from the moon which means it would be falling into the atmosphere at 34,000 miles per hour. Actually, I think it's 24,000. Gosh, I should have learned that before I said those numbers, but up fast, really fast. Okay, um, so they wanted to perfect the entering the atmosphere and, um, and then they wanted to learn how to land on land. I don't know why that is. I don't know the motive for that, but they gave up on that. So they tossed out the land on land stuff and they just stuck with the splashdowns, which we're very familiar with in the US space program. The Soviets landed on land, but the United States always been a splashdown based um, Gemini and Apollo and Mercury projects. All of these goals were met except of course they canceled the landing on land uh, in 1964. But they did replace that with another goal, a goal which they did achieve, and that is what they call the EVA, or extra vehicular activity. In other words, open the spacecraft up, the astronaut gets out, does some work, walks around out there, quote unquote walks, and then gets back in the spacecraft. And so that goal uh, was achieved with Gemini as well. And one of the reasons that um, Jim and I, they were always planning to do it, I suppose, but I don't know why it wasn't created as one of the initial major objectives, but it certainly became one uh, in 1964. Now, they only have six working astronauts at this point in time, and there is no way that just these six astronauts can do all of this stuff. However, of course, they thought they were superhuman and they're like, we don't need any more astronauts. But you see, I've got my little cartoon here. You know, we're gonna need more astronauts, Chris. The original seven ain't gonna like that, Bob. And then there's Gordon Cooper going, yeah, he's got that right. And they didn't like it. But in the end, Bob Gilruth was running the entire astronaut show and he got to make the call. Chris Kraft was the head flight director of all the missions and he got to make the call and so what? They got more astronauts. So let's welcome the new nine. Again, this happened before they completed Project Mercury. And um, so this is the second round of astronaut selection. And obviously as you can see, there's nine of them. Uh, you 
probably don't recognize some of these people, but this is Neil Armstrong right here. Uh, this is Frank Borman. Frank Borman was the commander of the first mission to the moon that ever went to the moon. People think it was Neil Armstrong. It wasn't, it was Frank Borman. A Frank Borman, fun note, if you see your little Borman auto uh, license plates running around town, yes, that's Borman. The Borman Autoplex was owned by Frank Borman. Um, we have some other astronauts in here. Uh, maybe you know Jim Lovell. He was the commander of Apollo 13, and that was a, a big movie put out by Ron Howard. And um, I'll talk about some of these other individuals later. I, I know them all by name. I've read every one of their autobiographies, except for this gentleman, um, Elliot C. And poor Elliot C. didn't actually get to fly in space. He had crashed one of his T-38 trainer jets uh, while he was actually um, commander of uh, one of the Gemini missions before it took off. And so while he was on prime crew, he, um, he didn't fly, he died. So that's one of the, the three astronauts that I'll be talking about today that didn't survive, uh, didn't die in space, but actually, um, or, or in a, on a mission itself, but actually just before he flew. Again, I mentioned at the end of last lecture that the Gemini uh, capsule actually was a, a sent aloft on top of a Titan II booster. This is a man-rated intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, basically, they just pull these things right out of the silos, fix them up a little bit to man-rate them, and stick a Gemini on top, and off they go. So, you know, it was all about nuclear bombs, and, and uh, they just took that technology and applied it for lofting humans into space. Then a year later-ish, we have the 14, and you're probably picking up something here, which is that each astronaut class uh, has its own name. And now there's been many classes of astronauts. And so you can go on Wikipedia or something and you can look them all up, but you know, the new nine, and then these guys were called the 14. This is the third group of astronaut selection. And um, you might recognize some faces here, for example, this is Buzz Aldrin, and this is Michael Collins. So you can see that they made it into the third class of astronauts, whereas Neil uh, Armstrong made it into the uh, second class. A lot of moonwalkers here, uh, many of them dead. But uh, I'd like to point out that we have um, Charlie Bassett here, and we have Cliff Williams. They were two astronauts that also died. Um, Charlie Bassett died with Elliot C. They were actually in the same plane that crashed. And then uh, Cliff Williams uh, perished in a freak accident where he uh, ran into a flock of geese and one cracked the canopy. Uh, I guess they burned out his engine, uh, very similar to that uh, flight that landed in the Hudson uh, with uh, Captain Sully. But um, it turns out that uh, Cliff Williams was not um, able to recover from this accident and so he died. But the rest of these people flew on Gemini and many of them also flew on Apollo. Okay, now I've been saying that term, the wild west days of space flight and rocketry, et cetera. But, you know, I just want you to know that this really was where we learned how to, uh, to go from crawling to walking in terms of space flight. Um, as I mentioned, Gemini is fairly much a forgotten program, but it's where we learn every basic component of how to fly in space. Okay, so each time the astronauts went up, they were doing something new that no humans had ever done. And these maneuvers required a lot of delicacy in the way that they were moving the spacecraft. So they could be moving at 18,000 miles an hour and making delicate moves that were sort of like, you know, an inch a minute type of moves. We watch movies with space flight in it all the time. And you have a completely and totally distorted sense of how things transpire. It's very slow, okay? So, you know, when you talk about Dragon uh, from SpaceX, the Dragon spacecraft docking with the International Space Station. I mean, it literally takes hours 
for them to approach slowly because they're moving at 18,000 miles an hour and they have to come at each other coming at inches, okay, per minute or, you know. So the, the case is that space is very slow, it's very delicate, and you have to know what you're doing because if you make a mistake, there's no second tries. Right? If you crack the spaceship hull uh, and lose your atmosphere, you're, gone, you're a goner. And you're doing things that nobody's ever done before. Um, there are people who, many of them doctors or psychologists who thought the, the astronauts were gonna crack during these things, they weren't gonna make it, or else that physically they wouldn't be capable of it. Um, and they were disproved in every way. I mean, these, uh, these, these astronauts really were brave, they were bold, and they were intelligent, and they were physically fit. So they put it all together and they were able to accomplish these goals, okay? Now, by the time Gemini was done, we basically knew how to bread and, you know, butter our toast, so to speak. And um, here's, we, here's we go, all right? There's my little list of all the things that came out of Gemini. Number one, the second actual ever spacewalk by a human because the Russians beat us again. So the Soviets made the first spacewalk with Alexei Leonov. And uh, I mentioned him in the previous set of slides with Project Mercury because he was the commander for the uh, Apollo Soyuz mission. He, he met and shook hands with Deke Slayton in 1975. And really that was the thawing of the space race or the, what I can tend to think of the end of the space race. And then he uh, is the, was the number one candidate that the Soviets had for being the, their astronaut to land on the moon. But anyway, he walked in space first using Tsiolkovsky's methods that we talked about back in the uh, early part of this module. And uh, anyway, Ed White from um, the Gemini Project was the uh, second person to walk in space and the first American to walk in space. Then we had the first changing of one orbit to another orbit. This is called a transfer orbit so that you can basically uh, rendezvous with, uh, preparing to rendezvous with another uh, spacecraft if you want. Then we had the first rendezvous of two orbiting manned spacecraft. Okay, this did require learning, uh, the using orbit transfers, which were learned in a previous mission. Then we had the first manual docking of two orbiting spacecraft. In this case, one was manned and one was unmanned. And Neil Armstrong gets the feather in his cap for doing that. First human being to actually dock two spacecraft together ever. Uh, first orbiting transfer using the engine of the dock spacecraft. So remember I said that that second goal included then docking with an unmanned spacecraft, but then using the engine in that uh, target vehicle, the unmanned spacecraft, to then uh, fire that engine and change your orbits. And so they, they learned how to do that. They did transfer orbits uh, going up to sometimes 800 miles above the earth and set altitude records that weren't broken until uh, astronauts went to the moon. Um, they first, the, uh, first performed on a spacewalk uh, which required work. Okay, so um, this turned out to be a very difficult and highly challenging aspect of the um, of uh, Project Gemini was getting out of the spacecraft and actually doing meaningful work because they didn't know how to work in zero G. And um, basically when they tried to turn a screw, uh, the Newton's third law, if you push on something, it pushes back with you, put on you with an equal and opposite force. And so what happens then is that they would end up turning themselves rather than turning the screw. And they had to figure out how to do this. And there's many stories of them tumbling through space with their cord wrapped around their neck and you know all kinds of stuff. Uh, in fact, two astronauts almost died trying to do this work in the spacewalk. And it was good old Buzz Aldrin uh, on Gemini 12 that figured out how to make it work. So that actually was scary. Uh, a couple of those missions where they thought they might not bring home one of their astronauts. And then they had the duration record at the time of two weeks in space, 14 days. And that was Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. So I'm gonna go through these missions just a little bit. 
uh, to give you an idea of what Project Gemini was all about. So let's start with the first four missions here. Um, the first Gemini 1 and Gemini 2 were unmanned uh, rehearsal flights of the uh, Titan II mated to the um, Gemini spacecraft. And then the third mission, Gemini 3, uh, was flown by Gus Grissom, who was a Mercury astronaut. Remember, his Mercury space capsule sunk in the ocean. And uh, John Young, who was a member of the second class. So John Young uh, was singled out right away by the original seven as being the most talented of astronauts. Um, he really was a spectacular astronaut. I mean, he, he, he flew on Gemini, then he later commanded Gemini, uh, second Gemini mission. Then he commanded, or no, sorry, then he went to the moon on Apollo 10 as a command module pilot. Then he commanded Apollo 16 and walked on the moon. And then he was the first uh, pilot commander of the first space shuttle mission. So um, he's had a tremendous career, uh, one of the most spectacular astronauts of, the, of all the astronauts in the groups. Anyhow, this uh, was a four hour flight. It was what we call a shakedown. Whenever you fly the first flight, you know, it's called a shakedown mission. So this was a shakedown. And it was basically um, three orbits, bada bing, up and, up and down. Um, now, if you're interested in some of the fun stories, John Young had smuggled a corned beef sandwich into his pocket and took it up there and they ate it in the spacecraft. And apparently they got in some serious hot water over that. And uh, they enjoyed their corned beef sandwich, but when they when they got back to the ground, their bosses kind of spanked them on the little astronaut bottoms. And um, I think the other thing I wanted to say about this Gemini mission was that um, Gus Grissom had decided to name his spacecraft the unsinkable Molly Brown. Now you can guess why he wanted to name his spacecraft the unsinkable Molly Brown because he didn't want to have another spacecraft sink on him. And in fact, all Gemini flights, after they splashed down, they opened the hatches for both astronauts. You know, they, they had a little life wrap that came out from underneath the spacecraft and kept it floating. And then they opened the hatches, not Gus. Gus was like, you know what? My hatch blew last time. And I'm going to show you all that I can sit there and and get pulled out of my spacecraft and not open the hatch. And so he did not open the hatches and they were lifted up and brought onto the aircraft carrier without the hatches being opened. And it was just basically Gus proving a point. Okay, as you can see, I know a lot of trivia about these missions and I will try not to bore you too much with all of them. The next mission up is Gemini 4. It flew in June of 1965. This is James McDivitt and Ed, Edward White, or Ed White. Now, James McDivitt went on to command Apollo 9, um, and that is, uh, was a spectacular mission that tested the lunar landing module, which we'll talk about. Ed White, uh, unfortunately, he was on Apollo 1, and they had a fire in the space capsule while they were on the ground in 1967, and he perished in that having not gone to space again. But, excuse me, I, I should mention also that Gus Grissom was commander of Apollo 1 and he perished in that fire as well. Um, Ed White though uh, was given the um, green light for the first spacewalk. And this was in response to Alexei Leonov's spacewalk. The United States decided, whoa, the Soviets walked in space Next mission, Ed, you're going out of the spacecraft. So that's what they did. And then here's a beautiful picture of Ed White. And I, I believe he was out there for 22 minutes in total. And he basically floated around and it looked easy. Everybody thought, well, that's another one off the checkbox. We've got it. But as you'll see from our story, that turns out to be um, a dangerous venture. So then here's uh, uh, Jim McDevitt and Ed White looking all seriously uh, when they returned home. Gemini 5, okay, so this was a mission that was this, uh, um, what you would call a medium 
duration mission, and it was meant to push the length of missions to about half of what the, the total duration that they thought would take to get to the moon. There were some other things that happened too, like this is the first time that a spacecraft ever used fuel cells, and the fuel cells were an engineering innovation to use uh, basically water to uh, create energy and hydrogen and, then, uh, and oxygen for breathing. They did about 120 orbits over seven days. And uh, you know, this mission uh, really doesn't get talked about that much when people talk about Gemini. It sort of gets looked over, but it was a, a definite test. Um, and the thing about it was that the fuel cells actually really crapped out on them. And it was, uh, it was a pretty hard, hard, rough road for them up there, but they got home safely. Now you might wonder why, what's going on here, why Gemini 7 comes before Gemini 6. And of course, this is a, a very interesting story. Gemini 6, of course, was supposed to fly. And what happened was that somebody left a little cap on a valve down in the engine compartment somewhere. And the whole computer system of, lift, of liftoff and countdown went down, you know, three, two, one, the engines lit up and then the engines just shut down. And so now these two astronauts are sitting on the top of this Titan II booster, huge amount of explosive potential. The engines just shut down. There's fumes. I mean, all you need is a spark and it's sayonara astronauts. And the only way to escape the Gemini spacecraft in those days was to pull basically one of those rings that would then have give you a jet seat and jettison you out of the spacecraft. They figure that you had a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance of surviving that. And if you, by survival, they just meant like, you know, that you would live. It didn't mean you would ever walk again. So this was Wally Shara, and he decided to stay cool. And they finally were able to get them out of that spacecraft, but it was a touch and go there for them. So while that was happening, uh, they decided to send Gemini 7 up ahead of Gemini 6 while they fixed Gemini 6. Um, there's a, another thing that, that happened as well, and that is that there's a spacecraft called the, the um, uh, Agena that was supposed to lift off, and that would be the unmanned spacecraft that they would meet up with when they rendezvoused, and uh, that exploded. It didn't make it to orbit. So, but between those two things with Gemini six, it was just like, you know what? Let's <laughs> send up Gemini seven, and we'll send up Gemini six later. So Gemini seven flew first, and this was Frank Borman of Borman Auto, and this was Jim Lovell of Apollo thirteen, and they spent seven. I'm sorry, 14 days inside of a Gemini spacecraft. Now, there is, they, they consider it to be like two people in a phone booth. There really wasn't any motion. You're weightless, so you're never using energy. And they said it was horrific. You can't sleep, you're eating. Just imagine trying to take care of going to the bathroom. Uh, no privacy whatsoever. They always required one individual to have their space suit on. And I think it was probably a two hour deal just getting a spacesuit off and the other spacesuit on for the other person back and forth. Anyway, it really was probably roughing it in a large way. But anyway, they made it through. And it turned out that, as I told you, the Gemini or the Agena spacecraft had exploded for the Gemini 6. And Gemini 6 was supposed to rendezvous with that Gemini with that Agena spacecraft. And so um, what they decided to do was use Gemini 7 as the target vehicle for Gemini 6. Okay, so here's what the Agena spacecraft looked like. Here we have the Gemini. And again, this is the area where the astronauts are. This is a docking area plus uh, radio, plus parachutes and these things like this and uh, also maneuvering thrusters. And then this is where the fuel cells are and storage and things like that. The Agena spacecraft uh, would mate in this way. It had an antenna 
and it had also its own booster. So the uh, Gemini and Agena would, would dock this way in theory when they finally did dock. And here is a, um, a Gemini spacecraft itself. Um, this is during a Gemini mission. And you can see that this is with the docking ring. And then you have the engine in the back here. Um, so this docking ring or docking collar um, was, was where they would you know, come in. And then if, uh, if you can imagine this configuration, you fire this rocket, uh, you're going to be pushed forward, um, you know, and it's weird. That's what they call eyes out uh, G forces, so that you're 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 being pushed this way, and so you feel the force this way. And um, that's one of the things that the astronauts had to experience. And I can only imagine what it was like to watch the rocket uh, fuel uh, thrust come out of the front end of that rocket while you're being pushed backwards like that. Um, when the astronauts did their EVAs, uh, where they were working in space, part of that was that they, you know, they would open the hatch here and then they would climb along the Agena here and, and perform work along the outside of it as a way of practicing. So here's Gemini 6, and this is the mission that then flew after Gemini 7 uh, was in space. And so it actually lifted off while Gemini 7 was about halfway through their 14 day mission. This is Tom Stafford, and this is Wally Shara of uh, the Mercury 7. And um, these two gentlemen, uh, as I told you, had that huge scare where the uh, engine shut down on them. But Wally Shara, I think, probably saved their lives by not pulling the jettison cord. So they went up there and Wally Shara performed the actual first maneuver of rendezvousing. And there's some spectacular pictures of them where they've taken some movies uh, of each other through the windows. And Gemini 6 would, you know, at, at 18,000 miles an hour around the earth, Gemini 6 would do these little end arounds and circle around and practice going around Gemini 7 and all of these things that, that Wally Shara was able to accomplish as a pilot and really showed how, how you fly in space. So by the time Gemini 6 had flown now and Gemini 7, uh, a, a huge had, amount had been learned about changing orbits, some dura long duration space flight and rendezvousing in space and maneuvering the spacecraft around their common uh, motion in orbit. So next up is Gemini 8. And you may have recognized this name, Neil A. Armstrong. So this is Neil Armstrong's first mission. And he was the commander of this mission. And he flew, he flew with David Scott. Later on, you'll see that David Scott actually uh, will fly on Apollo 9. And then he will fly on Apollo 15 and command Apollo 15. Their mission objectives were to rendezvous with the Agena, dock with the Agena, and then David Scott was supposed to get out of the spacecraft, do an EVA, and do some work. Now, these two gentlemen are lucky to be alive today. When they finally docked with the Agena spacecraft, it turned out that a thruster got stuck on the Gemini, and this caused them to start rotating, okay? And so they started, and what happens if with unbalanced force like that is the, the rate will pick up and pick up and pick up. And they started to rotate around about, so they were spinning around once a minute. And they didn't really know what to do. They'd been playing with uh, the, they thought that the problem was with the Agena spacecraft, not with their Gemini. So they were trying to shut off all these things and all the power on the Agena. Meanwhile, now they're going end over end over end. And they finally realized they got something wrong with their own spacecraft. And Neil Armstrong decided before the two tore apart and he lost the nose of his Gemini spacecraft, he, he undocked. Now, because the uh, mass now has dropped dramatically and you still have the same force pushing on the spacecraft, it accelerated even more quickly. Now they're spinning around very, very fast to the point where they're ready to black out. And Neil Armstrong, nicknamed Mr. Coolstone, figured out how to get them out of it. 
by shutting that thruster down and then firing the retro rockets, which then allowed him to change the moment of inertia of the spacecraft so that he could rotate it around and stabilize its motion. And that all happened, much of that happened with no radio communication on the ground because during Gemini, as I was mentioning before with Mercury, they didn't have continuous radio coverage around the planet. NASA had set up these small radio stations in different continents and islands around the planet, and they had sort of this 10-minute cone of visibility, but there were 10-minute regions or so between them where the spacecraft was out of radio contact. It's not like today. And this all happened when they were out of radio contact. When they came back into radio contact, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we're spinning out of control and all of this stuff. But anyway, uh, David Scott was really upset because not because he came home alive, but he was really upset because he didn't get to do his spacewalk. And he felt that that would uh, stunt his astronaut career and make him a less valuable astronaut in the future. But he somewhat how was able to overcome that. But here's the, here's the uh, landing. As I was saying before, they have a little uh, raft that they put the Gemini in, which stabilizes it. And then they open the doors and get the astronauts out. Uh, Gemini 9. Uh, Gemini 9 was also meant to rendezvous with a, um, Agena. The first Agena exploded again. It didn't make it up into space. And then when the second Agena went up, um, oh, I'm sorry, they didn't send up a full second Agena. What they did was they, they, they made a uh, modified Agena spacecraft and put on it something called an ATDA, an Augmented Target Dock Adapter. Now this was just meant so that they could dock with something up there. It wasn't a full-blown Agena. And so that flew up and they put this adapter on there. And then that's called a shroud that's opening up. And you can see in this picture down here at the bottom, the shroud actually got stuck and didn't open all the way, so they couldn't actually do any docking. And this got nicknamed the angry alligator. So their mission really was kind of washed out in the sense that uh, they were sort of the bad luck mission. They didn't get to dock with the Agena and fire its engines or do anything like that. And uh, so this idea of, of once you dock with the Agena and firing its engine to, to move the combined stack, uh, that got delayed. However, Gene Cernan was decided uh, that he was going to do some serious work as an EVA. And in fact, he was supposed to take this uh, Navy jetpack out of the back of the spacecraft and put it on. And he had to assemble some parts and everything to do this. And then he was going to fly around Buck Rogers style uh, back all the way back in 1966. And I apologize if you don't know who Buck Rogers is. Google it. Okay, he, he was a phenom for years. Um, anyhow, um, he uh, really did not know how to do this well, and he ended up sweating, his visor fogged over, he lost, I forget how many pounds of water, um, and he, his, the bottom of his spacesuit was filled with sweat uh, up to his ankles with water. He, he literally almost died, and uh, Tom Stafford, the commander, really thought that he might have to cut his umbilical and come home without him. It was really scary for them, but um, in the end, they did 44 orbits and came home alive. Uh, Gemini 10, 11, and 12 were really when the program hit stride. This is John Young again of the Gemini 3 corned beef sandwich um, debacle, and Michael Collins, Command, uh, command module pilot for Apollo 11 that you probably know, you know, the Armstrong Collins and Aldrin uh, crew. Um, this was the first uh, mission where they rendezvoused and docked with the Agena and then fired the Agena's engines and changed orbits using the Agena, Agena's propulsion. So that was a, a great boon. And then uh, Michael Collins did some spacewalks and he did a pretty good job. He still struggled a great deal, but he, um, he, uh, he did a much better job than Gene Cernan did. And he, they, they really kind of cut back on the expectations just to try it, you know, more of a stepping stone uh, process rather than just go straight for some jetpack thing. 
uh, right off the bat for the second spacewalk. I think they, they got a little bit overconfident there. Anyway, uh, Gemini 10 was a great success for a two-day mission. Uh, then Gemini 11 was put on by these two clowns, uh, Charles Gordon and Richard Gordon. I'm sorry, Charles Conrad and Richard Gordon. Uh, uh, Conrad, also known by the name Pete, he goes by Pete Conrad, um, was a clown, a super intelligent clown. And if you ever get a chance to watch H HBO's From the Earth to the Moon, there is one episode on Apollo 12, and you should really watch it. It is very entertaining because the actors really capture the clown attitude of Pete Conrad, and he set the tone for all of his emissions. And it turned out that Richard Gordon was really a good friend of his from the test pilot days. And Pete Conrad made it in the second round of astronauts and Gordon made it in the third. And they was like two good old buddies and they got to fly together uh, for the first time in space in Gemini 11. This was an altitude record. They went up to 740 miles using the Agena. Again, they repeated Gemini 10 mission, uh, set the altitude record. Gordon did an EVA. Um, and again, uh, Gordon also really kind of botched his EVA. He was sweating profusely and um, was not quite near what Cernan uh, had got to, but definitely uh, was in danger. And Pete Conrad was a little bit nervous about that. Finally, you have Gemini 12. This is the final Gemini mission. This is Jim Lovell and um, uh, Buzz Aldrin. Also, Edwin is his true name. Uh, they flew for three days and uh, 22 hours, so almost four days. And this was an inch, a situation where they, uh, they did the rendezvous and the, with the Agena. Um, they did a lot of uh, station keeping with the Agena. And Buzz Aldrin went out and did five hours of extravehicular activity. And um, you can see this really fun little thing here as they're walking up the plank to go to the uh, spacecraft. Um, that they've got a little the end tied to his back. The astronauts did have some sense of humor. Here's a picture of Buzz Aldrin uh, on his EVA. And Buzz Aldrin trained in a new way. It was the first time that they threw astronauts into the swimming pool to have them train in this buoyancy environment. And that really was a game changer. The other thing is that Buzz Aldrin uh, got his doctorate in rendezvous mechanics or orbital mechanics. So he was known as Dr. Rendezvous. He had an amazing sense for zero G. He was very much a physicist astronaut rather than a test pilot astronaut. And uh, this allowed him to have an intuitive feel for what it would be like in zero G and how Newton's third law would respond to him or how he would respond to Newton's third law in zero G. And he did a beautiful, smooth EVA, never broke a sweat. Um, here are two images from extravehicular activities. Uh, we have Ed White on the left with his Gemini 4 EVA that lasted 22 minutes. Uh, this is, um, he only did one EVA. And basically, what did he do for 22 minutes? He floated and he got out. Um, and then uh, Buzz Aldrin and Gemini 12 did three EVAs, uh, totaling five hours and 30 minutes. And he performed a lot of these simple tasks like turning screws, taking plates off, screwing them back on, and things like that. Just to demonstrate that one could do this kind of work. And again, the EVA was the most challenging part of uh, Gemini. And two astronauts really literally worked themselves to the brink of not being able to get back into the spacecraft under their own power. And there was no way that the commanding astronaut who stayed in the spacecraft could help them get in. There was just not enough room. There was no way with the pressurized suit to get the leverage to pull them in, reach over and close their hatch. It was just not a possibility. So it was Aldrin and Gemini 12, uh, which they mastered EVA, which was just in time for Apollo. So I'd like to mention the astronauts that did not get to partake 
in Project Gemini nor in a Project Apollo. They are, uh, again, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett from the second class of astronauts. Uh, sorry, Elliot C. from the second class of astronauts, Charlie Bassett and Curtis William, Clifton William from the third class of astronauts. Uh, let's start with um, uh, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett. They were on their T-38. They were the prime crew for Gemini 9. God, Gemini 9 had all the luck, I'm telling you. And you know, they're the one with the angry alligator. Um, they were flying to the uh, manufacturing plant where their spacecraft was being built and put together and finalized. And it was a foggy day. And um, what happened was that uh, T Elliot C was flying in the front and he clipped his wing on the building and they tumbled and that was it for them. And they set the building on fire and uh, Stafford and Cernan were following them. Uh, they were gonna land behind them. They had pulled out, they decided to, to wave off on their landing and uh, they watched uh, C and Bassett basically explode and die, which must've been absolutely horrible. But the interesting thing is there's this uh, guilt feeling too, because that they knew then that they were the prime crew and uh, would be flying Gemini 9. Um, Curtis Williams, he never really got assigned to a mission and the poor man died in October of 67 and, and he hit a flock of geese. And like I said, one cracked the canopy, his engines flamed out. And so um, in, in Gallo's humor, I'd like to say that the, the space capsule um, um, I'm having trouble finding what, what I always say it says that the um, space capsule payload, I'm gonna say is a flock of geese. How's that? I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget it. Okay. So um, as we heard um, about the fire in Apollo 1, um, then we had uh, Gus Grissom and Ed White who died and then uh, you didn't meet him yet, but he was also a, a, a third round pick was uh, um, Richard uh, Chaffee who died in Apollo 1. And so the, it turned out that when Dave Scott commanded Apollo 15, uh, when he walked on the moon, he put in the fallen astronaut memorial there. And this has the names of, of all the astronauts up to that time who had died in the line of uh, pioneering space flight. And uh, you'll notice that there's more than the, the uh, six astronauts from the United States, which was Elliot C., Charles Bassett, Curtis Clifton Williams, um, uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. But there's also some Soviet names on here. And so there's, there's quite a few Soviet astronauts that also died. And when we go into that story, uh, we'll talk about some of those astronauts that fell. This is what a Gemini spacecraft looks like. Again, I was telling you that the astronauts are only in this capsule area here, and this whole nose area is full of different things like parachutes and thrusters and radios and radars and things like this. And then all of the equipment required to support the astronauts, power the spacecraft, et cetera, are all in this back area here, which uh, sort of like what, what was a, sort of a service module to the spacecraft. Here's, uh, looks like Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin for the Gemini 12 mission. And this gives you a feeling for the fact you're all space suited up, which, you know, is very bulky. And you can see there's very little room to sit in this spacecraft. I mean, you literally couldn't move hardly at all. Here's the spacecraft itself, like a small little sports car. Each side has these eight balls for, you know, knowing the orientation, some, um, and then a stick for the thrusting. Um, this side of the panel controlled controls for uh, firing up the Gemini spacecraft um, so that the, uh, the pilot, uh, there's the commander and the pilot, and the pilot sat on this side and he was able to uh, manipulate the Gemini spacecraft. And then here's probably a picture of Gemini 7 taken from Gemini 6 while they were doing the station keeping and uh, Wally Shira was buzzing around Gemini 7, uh, Borman and Lovell. 
Again, here's an, uh, an example, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but if you're interested, you can blow this slide up and you can look at all the different components. And so I just want to point out how crowded this is, how little area there is to move. And when you move this hatch, I mean, literally this hatch would touch the top of your helmet. And um, if, the, if your suit was overexpanded or something like that, you, you couldn't get in. And it was very hard to get this thing to latch down um, and get the leverage to pull it down. And that turned out to be uh, one of the things that kind of um, the astronauts weren't very happy about. And last but not least, a nice shot of the inside of the spacecraft showing you, in fact, what, what it looked like. Um, and then uh, Frank Borman's quote here that two people in bulky spacesuits jammed in a telephone booth for two weeks. That's what he says Gemini 7 mission was. And that's what he stuck to all of his life. OK, so there you have it. There's Project Gemini. Uh, it was a, a very successful set of missions. Um, it was not without its uh, tragedies, per se, and uh, close tra tragedies as well. And these uh, missions set the tone for the pace and cadence at which NASA was just knocking off goals and the astronauts getting highly trained for what was going to be uh, Project Apollo, which was on the horizon. To quote Deke Slayton, they were on a roll, okay? They were really on a roll. And what we're gonna find is that they had something called go fever and they really wanted to get to that moon um, by 1969 or by 1970. And so now we've got to switch over to Project Apollo. And we'd had a single manufacturer make the, the uh, Gemini spacecraft and make the Mercury spacecraft, but a different government bidder had won the Apollo spacecraft. And so now you have a switching of cultures and a switching of companies that NASA has to deal with switching cultures on the spacecraft you know, uh, logistics and the building of that. And it turned out to be catastrophic in the end. And uh, that's why we had the fire in Apollo 1 and those three astronauts died, never having gone to space. They died in a simulated mission on the pad days before the actual mission was supposed to take off. And so we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back to Apollo. But our next set of lecture, our next lecture is going to be about the Soviet uh, missions that happened during the same period as Mercury and Gemini. So we'll see you next time and we'll be on the other side of the planet uh, with the Soviets. We'll see you then.